Oh, good. Now I, I can see people coming in. And um, they're in. Go ahead. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. I'm Claudia Mears, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's session of our uh, IERG virtual chapter. Uh, today's theme is about implementing strategy with, in a post pandemic world. And our, presenting, our presenter is uh, Mr. Jim Gitney. Jim is the CEO of Group 50 Consulting. And um, in a couple of minutes, I will introduce Jim to you and talk about his best knowledge and experience. Uh, but first, uh, uh, you allow me, uh, please, to go through some um, housekeeping items, OK? Um, I'd like to start to uh, suggest by suggesting you to, so you can get the most of the presentation, that you click the view icon at the top right of your Zoom screen and then select speaker view. Um, I'd like also to request that you please mute yourself for the entire presentation so things go uh, smoothly. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So I please ask you to send the questions directly to the moderator, that's, that's me. Um, and uh, if you have any technical questions, please send them directly to Ruth and uh, she will respond to you. Our agenda for today's event uh, is here. I'll be the moderator and I'll do the introduction and, and interact with Mr. Gitney, but uh, I'll take just a, a couple minutes to give you a brief overview of IERGs uh, and our activities before I turn to Jim. And so, Again, at the end of the presentation, we'll have we'll reserve some time for questions. And again, um, send your questions using the chat feature. Uh, now about IRG, uh, we, we were founded uh, about twenty six years ago as a um, global nonprofit uh, professional association for senior executives who, who, who had the opportunity to live and work abroad outside of their home countries. And, and, and therefore were able to acquire some um, enriched um, uh, and more in-depth exposure to the diverse business environments and cultures around the world. And, and that's what we do. We get together to share this and enrich our talents and knowledge uh, continue to build our global context and, and, and then expanding our base of referrals too. So hopefully you can grow our professional opportunities, uh, opportunities as well. Um, at this point, we are just uh, about over 200 uh, business leaders that are members of IRG around the globe, okay? Um, still about IRG, uh, uh, and, and, and talking about events and meetings. Uh, throughout the year, um, the different chapters in, in different locations, they promote events that uh, with kind of high level conversations discussing uh, a variety of relevant and, and, and impactful themes as well. Uh, what you see here is just a small sample of events that, that took place over the past year. And uh, I like to suggest that you please go to our webpage to, so you can obtain more detailed information uh, of our activities. And then uh, also, if you are not a member yet, I suggest you apply to become one. Um, now about uh, Mr. Gitney, our presenter today. Um, Jim, I'm sorry uh, for aging ourselves like this, but I, I first met Jim in the early 90s um, when we were both working for Black & Decker Corporation. Um, and today, after a few decades, um, Jim is the CEO of Group 50 Consulting and, and uh, where he has developed this methodology that we'll be discussing today and, and, and applying the, the uh, I would say, immense knowledge acquired over um, this 40 years of operational experience. Uh, hey, Jim is just also launching his new book. The name is Strategy Realize the Business Hierarchy of Needs. You can get them uh, at Amazon.com. 
So with no further delay, I'd like to bring you Jim Gitney. Jim? Claudio, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to join you. That's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a real honor. I'm going to share my screen here. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. So what we want to talk about today is implementing strategy in a post-pandemic world. And I think all of us can agree that we have a new experience on our hands. And that experience is around the way the workforce has changed and how remote work has become such a larger part of the uh, post-pandemic post world and how easy or difficult it is, depending on your perspective, in being able to work closely with your colleagues and to be in tune with what's going on inside your business. The reality is that productivity over the last two years has gone down. Now, there's going to be a few of you in the audience and even a few of my clients who say that, well, you know, we're, we're getting more things done because we're spending less time on commuting and we're able, we have a better work-life balance, et cetera. And all of those things are true. But in terms of the raw measurement, productivity is going down. And so companies are going to be faced with the questions around the impact and lower productivity against their financial performance. And so whether we like it or not, we are going to be faced with a situation where people are going to start making decisions around productivity. And what I want to talk about today is way are ways to be able to address that issue and at the same time significantly improve engagement of all stakeholders across the business. Because as I said, this trend in the eyes of owners, in the eyes of shareholders, in the eyes of corporate conglomerates are is going to want to be addressed. Now, there's a component here of this productivity in that as we are starting to move into a global downturn, whether you want to call it a soft landing or a hard landing is kind of immaterial at this point. Companies are reticent to restructure themselves because of the difficulty they've had in getting more employees. And so you aren't going to make the decision really quick to you know, realign your workforce. And as a result, that could be a contributor to the, this productivity number. But once again, I'll close this slide by saying that these kinds of results will not be taken, uh, will, will cause actions to be taken by senior leaders in the near term. The needs of the post-pandemic workforce have changed. Because for those of us who are remote, now, you know, Claudia and I have been remote for a long time. I've been, Group 50 has been a remote consulting firm since 2004, so we're used to it. But for those organizations that have not had significantly large workforce, remote workforces, they need to start paying attention to that, those needs. So there are probably a few of you in the audience who are familiar with something called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. In 1943, Abraham Maslow wrote his uh, preeminent paper on the hierarchy of needs, and he talked about five levels of needs for individuals. We have psychological needs, we have safe needs for safety and security, we need have love and belonging, self-esteem, and self-actualization before we can get to self-actualization, but more importantly, before we can be very successful at self-actualization. So you might go, all right, Jim, what does this have to do with business? Well, you know, the reality is that in order to move to each one of these levels, you have to complete 
fulfilling the needs of the previous level in order to move to the next one successfully. We all have needs and rely on others to help satisfy them. And the same concept applies to business. And that's what I want to share with you today. In 2013, I created something called the business hierarchy of needs. Now, unlike Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which has five levels, the business hierarchy of needs has three. And because we have, and in order to be able to properly manage and grow an organization, we have similar challenges. We have to create a very strong and foundation, a very strong foundational base, which is similar to the psychological needs in Maslow's hierarchy, strategy, alignment, and accountability. That's our strong base. And what's interesting is that as we move to level two, performance management organizational readiness, we see that three levels of Maslow's uh, hierarchy are covered here. Safety and security, love and belonging, and self-esteem. And that's the big challenge in managing today's post-pandemic workforce. We need to make sure that people inside an organization feel safe, feel like they belong, feel like they're appreciated, and then also have an opportunity to uh, reward their self-esteem. And so that's why level two is what I call the bridge between strategy and results. And then lastly, level three of the business hierarchy of needs is very similar to the self-actualization level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. As individuals in business, our personal needs are just as important. But we also need to take care, take into consideration the needs of teams. Because while you might satisfy my needs, my individual needs, I don't work as an individual. I work as part of a team. And what we need inside business is we need to have direction. We need leadership. We need the appropriate skills. We need the appropriate resources. And we need to feel like we're part of a team. You now, gone are the days of uh, individuals who carry the carry the brunt of the world on their shoulder, the brunt of the business on their shoulder, and end up in a situation where they are able to make everything happen. Now, that might happen in small companies that are one or two or five million dollars, where there's typically one leader who runs everything in his or her head and who understands everything that's going on in the business. And while that's a large chunk of the number, the 30 million businesses that are in the United States, right? The reality is that even the one in $5 million business needs to consider levels one, two, and three inside their organization. When I talked about individual needs, I also talked about team needs. And if you take a look at this graph, what it's basically sharing with you is the fact that businesses are done, are managed horizontally, not functionally. So if you sit and think about HR, or you think about finance, or you think about operations, or you think about marketing and sales, those are all what we typically call vertical silos. But marketing and sales don't run the business. They are part of a cross-functional team that runs the business. And so what we need to be really focused on in today's with today's remote workforce is that to make sure that those people are part of a team and that the team that they're part of can be successful. Remember, we need to make sure that the team has direction, it has leadership, it has skills, it has the resources it needs, and it understands how it belongs 
and what its function is inside the business. So while we want to talk, again, while we want to talk about individuals, what we need to make sure is that we talk about the teams that they're on. And what's really critical in today's businesses is that the technology backbone is the interface between the market-facing teams and the value-added teams. So if you sit and think about it, the market-facing activities collect the inputs. They collect the orders. They collect the service functions. They move money back and forth between the customer and the business. And all of that goes into the technology backbone that then feeds instructions to the, the value-added teams on how they're supposed to schedule the work that they do, whether it's products or services, doesn't matter because we need to take raw inputs, we need to add value, and then we need to sell either a product or a service. And so if you look at a business horizontally, now all of a sudden we have a bit of a different view on the needs of the teams that support that business. Now this is the chart where sometimes we get stuck because people look at the business hierarchy of needs as three levels and they go, well, that's pretty simple, I can get it. And then they look at this chart and they go, oh my, there's 29 things on this chart. We can't manage 29 things. And, and, and if you're suggesting that we manage those 29 things in order to uh, be more productive with today's workforce, we, 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 it's, it's just too complex. The reality is that every company does these 29 things regardless of their size. Every company, let me repeat that, every company does these things, these 29 things, regardless of their size. They have mission, vision, values, and a new term that might be, and a term that might be new to some of you, leadership traits. They have stakeholder objectives. Those are the things that the people who own the company or who, who finance the company want from the company. They have a value proposition. And so whether you're a $1 million company or a billion dollar company, you leverage the value that you offer to the marketplace because that's the reason people buy product from you. Now you might say, well, what, is, what does this have to do with managing post-pandemic workforce? Well, I'm going to get to these two elements right here. The most important goal and clearly defined business strategies. Now I'm an engineer and I have an MBA and I learned my trade as Claudio had mentioned, he and I learned our trade in companies like GE and Black & Decker. And I think Claudio will agree with me here that you know we were always taught that businesses should have three to five strategies and no more. Well, the reality is that 80% of strategies don't meet their intended value or don't realize their intended value. And 60%, <coughs> excuse me, 60% of leadership teams say that they don't do a good job of implementing strategy. And is that because strategies are bad? Not necessarily. It's usually because they're not implemented well. And part of that is because they're complex to the point where people throughout the rest of the organization don't understand the strategies and can't relate to them. So one of the things that we talk about in managing the post-pandemic workforce is that every company should have a most important goal. One clearly articulated most important goal. It might be doubling the value of, a com of the company, its enterprise value. It might be doubling sales. It might be acquiring another company. It might even be an exit. But if I have one most important goal that I can communicate to everybody in the organization, then that gives me an opportunity to make sure everybody understands where we're going and what we're doing. Then everyone can use that most important goal as the litmus test for judging what they're doing and how it fits in the bigger picture. Once we've identified the most important goal, we then move to clearly design, define business strategies. And 
before I go there, you know, we're talking at the business level, but think about your own organization, the organization that you're part of. If you're, you and your team have one most important goal that everyone's focused on, it makes decision making a lot easier. And it makes it much easier to communicate to everybody what that goal is and what they should be working on. The difference between a company that does well, that does okay and does well, is how well they orchestrate these 29 elements and how well they point all of these activities toward that most important goal. And so if you sit and think about the most important goal and you think about, well, what are the objectives we're going to have through the organization? How do we get alignment and agreement to those objectives? And that's especially important for the remote workforce in, in today's business environment. So that whether I'm sitting in my office in Los Angeles or I'm sitting in my office on top of a mountain peak in Denver or in Sky Mountain, if I clearly understand the most important goal that I'm supporting and what my part of it is, then that gives me an opportunity to be much more effective. Each level, just as in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, each level of the organization, each level of the business hierarchy of needs needs to be satisfied before you can successfully move to the next one. Here's the most, here's the piece the, the, to talk a little more about the most important goal. The reality is we want to know what we are working towards. Now, there are several books out there that say that millennials and Gen Xers want to feel like they're part of something bigger. They want to understand that the effort that they're putting in is going to deliver something larger. Well, the reality is I'm a baby boomer. And I've always wanted to know why I'm doing what I'm doing. What is that larger thing that we're going after? Because it changes the way I think, if I understand it. It gives me a little more pride in what I'm doing. And it makes me feel more comfortable in, with some of the decisions that are being made as a result. We all want to be led. I want to be led. Even when I was a CEO, I wanted to be led. I want to know from what to what by when. And that's part of the importance. That's one of the reasons why the most important goal is so important. Because it tells us from what to what by when. We want to participate in developing the how. Now, if you want to really grab everyone, get their attention, allow them to be part of the how. Now, I'm the type of guy during my career where just tell me the from what to what by when and let me have at it because I'm going to figure out how and I'm going to get it done. Okay. That's me. Claudio might have been a little bit different. I know lots of people in, in organizations I've worked with who want more direction. They want more specificity on how we're going to do it. But in the over 200 Kaizen events I've done during my career, I've never been more amazed at how often people who are part of developing the how get much more alignment and agree to much more accountability on the result. So I think that one of the most important things in managing today's post-pandemic workforce is to make sure that leaders clearly engage, clearly engage the people inside their organization who are both remote and on site in developing the how. If you come away with nothing else from this presentation, most important goal and engage people in the how for the processes, business processes that they own. We want to be able to plan for it and we want to be responsible for it. I know very few people who aren't willing to be responsible for what they do. I know a lot of people who aren't willing to be responsible for what they've been told to do that they're not part of. And that's an important distinction here. 
What's the other thing that's incredibly important is we need to have the skills now. Notice what I said before. I know a lot of people who are not willing to be accountable for something that was thrust upon them that they had no part of <clears throat> helping to develop. But what makes it even worse is if you expect me to something to do something and I don't know, I don't have the skills to do it. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about how we lead people in today's post-pandemic workforce. Make them part of the, give them the objectives. Make, help them understand the most important thing we're going after. Make them part of the how and give them the skills to do it. The last piece is we need to know that leadership supports us. So if you've done the previous three things we've talked about, then that's a perfect demonstration of leadership supporting our needs in the workforce. Satisfying these needs is the challenge to effective leadership. But it's not as difficult as you might imagine because it's easy to charter teams. It's easy to help them understand what their objectives are. And it's easy to get out of the way and allow those teams to figure out the how. Now, as we kind of walk through, I want to walk through in a little more detail some of the elements of the business hierarchy of needs to give you a little more flavor. So each level must be satisfied as before moving on to the next. We've already discussed that. And the critical elements in level one is the clearly defined business strategies that are focused on achieving a most important goal. Because if you tell me we're, our most important goal is to double revenues, I can build a strategy around that. We can build a strategy around that. If you tell me that the most important goal is to exit the business in five years, we can build together, build a strategy around that and make sure that everyone is part of it. And I know that for some of you, what might be going through your head is, oh no, we can't tell people we're going to exit the business. Well, the reality is if you make it worth their while, you can tell people you're going to exit the business. We need to know what our what our that our work will be part of achieving something bigger. Something that we haven't talked about is where to play and how to win. So remember I said most important goal can be easily communicated to people, all stakeholders in the organization, whether they're vendors, customers, suppliers, third party resources, contractors, contract employees, remote workers, or workers on site. I can communicate with a little bit of work. I can create a most important goal so that everybody knows what's going on. And I don't need a PhD or a master's degree or even a college education to understand that. That's important. Where to play and how to win are two additional things. All right. We learn that when we're kids. The first time we walk onto a baseball field or a soccer pitch or onto the football field or into dance class, it's very, very clearly defined where we're going to play. And how to win are the things that we do in order to excel at that. And so once again, I could take a simplified, most important goal, and I can clearly articulate where to play and how to win, and then allow everyone to participate in creating the elements that they're going to be responsible for in allowing that to happen. A lot of times, issues happen inside of organizations because there aren't clearly defined metrics that tell us the score. Notice I'm continuing along this theme here. Most important goal, where to play, how to win. So how to win is not only what we do to win, but we need to know whether we are winning or not. And that's where the score comes in. And so an, an important part of the business hierarchy of needs is goal setting throughout the entire organization and 
cascading objectives and measurements so that people know whether they're being effective or not. Because tell me what I'm going to be part of, allow me to create the how, and let me know whether I'm making progress or not. And that needs to be quantitative. It needs to be part of a set of metrics. Remember going back to the horizontal view of business, we operate businesses as part of cross-functional teams. And each team needs to be capable of achieving its objectives. So tell me I need to do a project and I get with my team and perhaps I need people from engineering, perhaps I need people from manufacturing, perhaps I need people from sales and marketing to be part of achieving that objective. Make sure that we have the right team with the right set of skills and that as we progress toward the most important goal, that we're willing to be able to make the changes to that team structure that will allow us to realize success. Now, you might remember that at one point in time, there's a conversation I suggested that one of a most important goal might be doubling in revenues. So for those of you who've been in a $50 million business or a $25 million business, that became $100 million, I think you'll all agree that the $100 million company and its organization structure and the skills needed to run it were significantly different than when they were just $50 million. And so this is sometimes where companies get into trouble and they hit what we call an inflection point because the existing organization, the existing business systems, and the existing structure are not capable of supporting the business as it grows. And so it's really important that we have the appropriate teams in place as we move toward the most important goal. Lastly, I think what's critically important is that each one of us have, uh, as individuals understand with them, what's in it for me? And I think, Claudio, we had that term all the way back into the 90s. This is not something that's just recent. WIFM has been around for a long time. Well, well, why is that? Well, WIFM has been around for a long time because it's really important that I understand what's in it for me and that I have the appropriate compensation practices and succession planning and skills development that satisfy my personal needs. Right. So remember, we're jumping back. Claudia, did you have a thought? Yep. 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 Go ahead. Um, one thought that's crossing my mind too is that uh, it's not uncommon for us to see that uh, companies and organizations that are halfway into their strategy implementation to realize that they don't have the talent that they need on board. They do an inventory check and say, ooh. What do we do now, right? Right. And part of this creating the most important goal, one of the exercises that leadership needs to go through is what is the, what does the talent that we need in the organization to operate the business as it is today? And what talent do we need to operate it in the future? Because as I had mentioned earlier, a $50 million business is going to have, have a hundred million dollar business is going to have significantly different needs than the fifty million dollar business. Lastly, the skills we need and where to apply them just in time. So, <clears throat> you know, we have this conversation about level three, which is implementation. A conversation the other day with a with a guy who was heading up a continuous improvement program for a multi-billion dollar corporation. And he said, well, I'm going to give training to people across all four divisions. And I said, you know, at the end of the day, that's the wrong thing to do. Pick a project that's part of, that is critically important to the most important goal. Identify what you need here in level two in order to make that project happen. 
give the people on the project team the skills they need to make it happen, and then go do the implementation. You do two or three or four of these, then all of a sudden continuous improvement will become a wildfire throughout the organization. Why? Well, because people see that it works, but more importantly, management sees that it moves the strategic needle and they're willing to continue funding it. They're willing to continue to give you money because you are positively impacting the business and helping it achieve its strategic objectives. And so we can go into a longer, much longer conversation around level three, but I think for the purposes of this conversation and how to manage a post-pandemic workforce, where we really want to focus our activities in level three is around best practices and process re-engineering. Because those are where we can apply skills very easily, such as value stream mapping, the brown paper exercise, and other things using remote teams as well. And so when we work on a strategic planning project, we create the strategies and the tactical objectives. We actually create and, and chart our project teams give them the objectives and allow and the skills they need to do that project and then allow them to, to use whatever they need to hear in the implementation side to realize the objectives of the project. And we only give them skills when they need it. We don't give them skills today and hope like, hope like heck that six months from now they're going to remember that. And inside the inside my book, I actually have a section about the total quality implementation that we did that Claudia and I did together in Black and Decker back in the 90s. If I were to redo it again, and we took the approach, we created all of these tools and training. And I went to Sao Paulo and I met Claudio and I sat with him and we did a three-day workshop and using interpreters, which was quite an interesting experience. And, you know, went through all of this training with these folks. And then I left town. And my expectation that Claudio and the, the, the team that ran the uh, Brazilian operations in Black & Decker were going to know what they needed to do from there was wrong. Not because Claudio and the team in Brazil were not smart folks, but if what we had done was we had done identified the most important goal, had gone and done some training, and then actually facilitated a major project that moved the strategic needle for the Brazilian operations, I think the, it, the process, implementing the process would have been far easier and far more effective. Now I'm gonna stop there because I have not spoken with Claudio about this. Claudio, an opinion on what I just said? You don't wanna know. <laughs> 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 yes, uh, it took, uh, I'll say many months until we got involved in a, in a project that uh, you know could use those skills and to your point, at that point, you say, what, what is it again that we need to do? Yeah. Yeah. So it's really important that we charter the teams. We help them understand what they have to do, what their role is. Give them an opportunity to be part of the how, which is the implementation side, whether it be process reengineering, value stream mapping, 5S, whatever the tool is, implementing a new technology. Let the team who owns the process be part of the how and part of the implementation. And that's the secret sauce behind, uh, we have to be much better at that with today's post-pandemic workforce. We have to be much, much better than that. And I don't hear people talking about that in great, in great detail. Notice this chart here. Level one is primarily the ownership of the C-suite and the owners of the company, because they're the ones who are responsible for creating the most important goal and the strategies to support it. But there should be healthy participation by the middle level of the organization. 
level two is primarily owned by middle level leaders. Those are the people who have the teams working for them and under them that are gonna be responsible for implementing the tactical objectives and strategies. Level three is primarily owned by others. While it is has some oversight from the C-suite, active in participation by the middle level leaders, it is primarily owned by everybody else. And this is consistent with the theme of getting out of the way and allowing the people who own the processes to make it happen. Look at the top right chart or top red box there. 34% of workers feel underutilized. That's a huge number. And if they feel underutilized, that means that they believe that they can contribute more to the organization and they aren't being asked to. When I ran Black & Decker's largest appliance factory, we had 2,000 people and I did a survey and I found out that almost 200 people, almost 10% of that organization had bachelor's degrees and master's degrees, some PhDs, people who built computer systems, built race cars, did all kinds of really cool stuff that was far more complex and far better, far more, um, required far higher skills, far more skills than what they were doing out on the shop floor. And when we tapped into that and launched total quality management inside of black inside of that facility, we went from we tripled the sales output of the production in that facility in three short years. And I could go on and on about stories of things that groups, small groups of people out on the shop floor did, small groups of people inside the office did that just never ceased to amaze me. So Engagement across all levels of the organization is required in order to properly implement strategy. And you have 34% of your workforce who can contribute more and who can be take a much larger role in implementing that strategy. It's up to us to lead, as leaders to make sure that we give the appropriate levels of the organization and responsibility for the part they can contribute to. So you might go, okay, Jim, this is a whole bunch of really great talking, waxing philosophically and all this. I was honored by the Gallup organization to provide this chart for my book. And utilizing the business hierarchy of needs change management framework with highly engaged business units and teams that are focused on the most important goal can yield these kinds of results. 23% improvement in profitability. Now this isn't from Jim Gitney, this is not from Group 50, this is from Gallup, a globally recognized organization. 18% improvement in productivity. Now, notice, in, if I go all the way back to the original chart, productivity is down 2.5%, 3%. Look at the opportunity we have inside the existing workforce. If we can get 18% improved productivity, then we all of a sudden have a much less of a pressing need in terms of how difficult it is to hire people and to find appropriate people. We can get 81% reduction in absenteeism. So if we have a 5% absenteeism problem, that can go down to 2%. We, in essence, have gotten 4% more people working inside the organization. The numbers are eye-popping, in my opinion. 18% reduction in turnover for high turnover organizations. And I won't spend any time talking about how much it costs to bring on a new employee and onboard them and get them up to speed, et cetera. It's much, much higher than the cost of that employee. 64% reduction in safety incidences. But here's the one that I want to end on. Going all the way back to the very beginning where we talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, 66% improvement in well-being. Why? 
because we as an organization have addressed the needs of individuals inside of teams and the needs of those teams. And so just think about your organization and what a 66% improvement in well being might do for it. Okay. If you if you liked what you heard, or even if you didn't, um, the business hierarchy of strategy realized the business hierarchy of needs, a step-by-step -step recipe for creating your own unique business hierarchy of needs and implementing what we've talked about in today's presentation. So Claudio, thank you for uh, asking me to be part of this. And why don't we go ahead and open it up to any questions that might exist? Sounds good. Let's see here. Hillary had a few questions here. I don't know if some of them you, you were able to answer uh, during your presentation. So I, I go for the last one. Sounds good. Um, what if uh, what's in it for me has nothing to do with salary or employee existing uh, job description. Have you seen alignment of work employee work to employees, personal talents, interests, and goals? I think you just talked about this, right? Yeah. So when we talk about what's in it for me, and we talk about um, and we talk about the importance of compensation and succession planning all of those pieces you know me being part of a larger goal all of those are pieces of what's in it for me because all of us are motivated differently some of us there are going to be some people who are motivated strictly by money but there are going to be others who are motivated by compensation practices such as maybe a gift card maybe an ad, uh, you know, a recognition in, in front of a large group of people. One of the things that was in it for me for groups that we do a lot of work with is when people from the shop floor can make a presentation to the CEO. The amount of pride and self-esteem they get from that is incredible. So when we talk about what's in it for me, hang on a second. When we talk about what's in it for me, what we're really talking about is each one of us are going to be motivated differently. And we need to satisfy those motivations. And it might be nothing more than being part of a team. It might be not, it might be, you know, utilizing, getting me out of that 34% that feel underutilized. Allowing me to contribute more to the organization. Was that helpful? Yes, thank you very much. Here's another one, uh, also from Hillary. Uh, she says, great insights. Uh, um, I'm sorry, here it is. Can this all, can this, all this be actualized as part of an annual early, yearly uh, strategic planning process? So, great question, but I don't believe in a yearly strategic planning process. Most um, strategic plans are living and breathing documents or plans. And so when we do strategic planning with companies, we will typically have monthly strategic planning meetings with only uh, with updates every six months and uh, every six months. And so what's important here is that if we're truly going to measure the outcome and our progress toward a most, a most important goal, we don't want to wait six months or a year and look in the in a rear view mirror to find out that we weren't making progress or that we didn't make enough progress. And the other issue that happens in today's businesses, especially in the post-pandemic workforce, is that <clears throat> we're spending less time working on the business. We're spending almost the entirety of our effort on working in the business. 
And so by creating a strategic planning process where we have monthly meetings and we, we structure, what we typically do is month one will be the, remember the uh, horizontal version of the business. Month one might be market facing. Month two might be value add. Month three might be technology. And so each one of these groups of uh, teams are presenting their part of their strategy, what the progress is on it, what midterm or changes we might need to make to strategy, update on resource needs, reporting on projects, et cetera. So we actually have a, a, a detailed process that goes month by month by month. And so that is one of the reasons why 60% of CEOs feel like they don't do a good job implementing strategy because they meet every quarter. And what I do is I spend the majority of my time arguing about what happened in the rearview mirror rather than talking about current events. Cool. Um, uh, Alfonso has actually two questions and I think they kind of go together. The first one is how frequent the strategy should be reviewed and is the strategy progress measured monthly through the budget execution? So if we've done a good job of cascading objectives and measurements throughout the, the uh, activities that support the most important goal in the strategic plan, those numbers are going to be real time. It might be production output. It might be gross margin for product. It might be total dollars in revenue. So those are those are measured real time. And so while we want to make sure that we we want to make sure that we have the appropriate measures in place throughout the organization for every activity, for every team so that they know what the score is. Remember going back to the where to play and how to win? We need to know what the score is. So while I might be looking at gross margin in a product portfolio that's much part, that's part of a much larger strategic measurement, I have, if I'm a product manager, I have my set of objectives and my measures that I'm responsible for. And I know how it fits in the bigger structure. And if we've done a good job of cascading objectives and setting goals, then I know whether I'm on target or not. Real cool. Um, this one is from Fabio. What is the most effective strategy to involve and engage the entire workforce in the shortest period of time possible? And what is the uh, average time frame you have seen for mid-sized to large organizations? What the average time frame for what? For in, for engaging the workforce? Okay. I assume that is yes. Yes. So I'm going to go back to this slide. Right here. Now, as you can imagine. Coordinating the activities of all 20, coordinating these 29 activities <laughs> isn't going to happen overnight, right? So typically what we do with, with our clients is get the most important goal out there. <coughs> Excuse me. Communicate it to everybody in the organization. And ask them, I even go as far as suggesting that it might be the startup screen on the computer when you start it up in the morning. And ask them to start thinking about what they're doing and when they do something and whether it supports the company's most important goal or not. Step one to engagement. Communicate that to them. Step two. As you finish your strategic planning process and you put your plans together, we hopefully are engaging more people in the organization through the chartering of teams to do specific projects. 
And because they're cross-functional, we now all of a sudden have a large swath of the organization who's involved in that implementation. When we go through a strategic planning project like this, it's typically going to be somewhere between six and 12 weeks, depending on the size of the organization and the number of locations and the number of people, obviously, uh, before we can have a fully fleshed out strategic plan. Now, in order, but it's a longer period of time, and I don't have the strategic maturity chart here uh, in this presentation, but it's a multi-year journey in order to be able to get people to continuously think this way. But what we want to do is we want to set the most important goal. Perhaps we have a rallying cry. Perhaps we have other marketing th things that we do inside the organization. But let's lead with the most important goal and communicate it. Ask everyone to think about their role in supporting that most important goal. Was that, did that answer your question, Fabio? Yes, it is answering uh, more or less. Of course, I was uh, interested about um, there is to communicate, of course, but when we go to skill development, right, we need to develop some behaviors in our entire workforce so they can really achieve the most important goals. So uh, what kind of strategies or tools or resources we can consider or think about to spread the message as fast as we can and develop the skills as fast as we can. So we have this, you know, you know, critical mass to transform the organization into something that we really want. Yeah, so Fabio, it's a, that's, a, that's a fabulous question, all right? I like to, to say, and Claudio's heard me say this before, that the most important goal is the politically correct way to say no. <laughs> And what I mean by that is that as people are doing things, if they can't justify in their mind how this supports the most important goal, and if leaders are asking them, how does this support the most important goal, and they can't answer it, they only need to be asked that question a couple of times, because not having the answer is embarrassing. Yeah. Right? And so if we do a good job of goal setting throughout the organization and cascading objectives, and we've chartered teams, and we've given those teams, remember going back to what I said, Claudia and I experienced in Black & Decker, charter mm -hmm. team to find the skill sets they need in order to get their project done. Yeah. All of that, all of that begins to uh, work its way throughout the fabric of the organization, right? And so we yeah. want to use the most important goal and, and the business strategies as the justification for everything we do. And that's the easiest way to begin that process, to start that snowball rolling down the hill, if you will. Yeah, this is a great uh, thinking process because, you know, I see, as you said, the most difficult part is to implement the, ex to execute the strategy, right? And I see a lot of CEOs and C-level executives saying that, Let's say customer experience is this this utmost uh, priority for them, but they don't do really anything concrete to develop the the behaviors and the, and the mindset the workforce need to deliver an outstanding customer experience. They just talk about it. They say it's important, but they don't invest time and money to give the workforce the resources they need to implement this strategy. That's why I'm so interested in uh, how we can find resources or tools or strategies to really get down to earth, right? And, and help those employees, those uh, hundreds of employees or thousands of employees many times to develop the skills they need so they know what to do to make this customer experience so relevant or you know, to, to achieve the proper execution of a well um, thought strategy. Yeah, so Fabio, uh, obviously because of time, I didn't have the opportunity to share some of these tools with you, but in the book, we talk right. about the five what's and the five how's mm. and the five why's. Great. Which I take from my, which I take back from our continuous improvement activities in Black and Decker years ago, 
Six Sigma stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you actually think about the most important goal, you'll never find improved customer experience as a most important goal. No, it's the means to achieve the most important goal. And yeah, right. One it's of the means, means yeah. to achieve the most important goal. It's a component of achieving the most important goal. And so we want to have the customer experience team say, you know what? If we improve customer experience by 50%, we can expect X more dollars in sales. And you go, okay, great. That's your objective. That's how you're contributing to us achieving the most important goal. You guys go and figure out how, right? And if we need to have, if, if we need to make other changes inside the organization, we'll have that conversation. And when I say other changes, it might be improvements in quality. It might be in improvements in service delivery, right? Or even in sales delivery, right? How to oh, right. conduct the sales, yeah. Right. Yeah. But the point is that you know, we force the conversation with the owners of that process here. Mm -hmm. Level three, tell us how what your objective is going to be. Have the conversation with them on what the objective is going to be because improving customer series, customer experience became one of the five hows, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so now we've decided we're going to do that. Now let's let that team define how they are going to actually achieve that. We have time for one more. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Here's, a, here's another one from, from Hillary. Uh, how to change company culture from silos into collaborative teams. I think I have the answer, but I'm on there to say it. No, go ahead, Claudio. Let's hear your answer. It's called MIG. It's called MIG. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. It's called MIG because if we allow functional organizations to exist, what we find out is that the majority of process failures inside the business are a result of handoffs between functions. And so I actually go as far in the book as suggesting that companies should be organized this way. which gets you out of the functional silo. But that's far, far away. That, that, you know, that's a long ways away from what we're talking about today. What we want to do is we create the most important goal, we create the strategies, and we charter cross-functional teams to be responsible for the projects that support those strategies and force the behavior that way. Hillary, was that helpful? Absolutely. Right. Very. So most important goal, business strategies, charter cross-functional teams to implement those strategies, have an owner for each team who has permission to be able to direct the individuals inside that team. And you'll see functional silos, the walls of functional silos begin to be broken down very quickly. Interesting. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Very good. Okay. I think it, it's about time. I must say something. I know what, I knew what to expect today and I'm out. So, and I think uh, most of us are out by the fluency that you go back and forth in this apparently complex methodology you put together. But it's easy to see and figure out and understand how the things get uh, work together, one thing with the other, thanks to your wonderful explanation. Once more, Jim, uh, thank you so much for doing this today. You're welcome, Claudio, and thank you for inviting me. It was my pleasure. Everybody, thank you so much. Uh, I, again, would uh, ask you, go to the IRG website, look for, uh, uh, there's a bunch of other activities there. And then again, for those of you, of you that are not members yet, we're going to come after you, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much. Good seeing you, Claudio. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, Fabio.